Welcome to Park Lane Baptist Church. We're glad that you're able to be with us and to look and study God's Word. That's one of the things that you will notice about Park Lane Baptist Church when you come, you, that we, we look at what God's Word has to say. Many people, I was reading an article in a magazine talking about making sure that you go into a, a good Bible-believing church. But at the same time, it, it confused what the gospel actually was. Look, the Bible is very clear about who God is, about who we are, and about the need that we have for Jesus Christ. Then it's simple, it's clear. There are some, some difficult things in Scripture, sure. But the, that which we can know very clearly is there. And it ought not be confused. At Park Lane Baptist Church, we encourage you to bring your own Bible. Look, make sure that what I am saying or anyone else is saying is exactly not what's just in the, in the words right there, but the whole context of it. That's what's great about Park Lane Baptist Church. You will enjoy solid biblical teaching. And I hope that you'll begin joining us at Park Lane Baptist Church and enjoying that worship together in a safe way, together in a way that honors God. This morning we're going to talk about faith. Book of Romans chapter 4 about faith. There are different kinds of ideas about what faith really is. A lot of people think faith is, is actually just kind of hope. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a positive outlook. outlook. That's not what faith is. At least not the faith that saves. This morning, we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about faith. And I hope you enjoy that. Tell me who you trust. Who is it that you trust? Uh, I, you, you trust your doctor, right? You trust your doctor to tell you if there's something wrong and how to fix it, right? Now, you trust your kids' teachers to tell them what is right. Then you, you even trust your bank so that way that when you put money into it, the next time you go, you expect that money to be there, uh, less whatever else that you've spent. You see, you trust them, you trust them quite well. Now, when your doctor tells you something, you don't go look it up in all kinds of medical uh, books and information and journals to try to make sure that they really diagnose you correctly with having the flu or with having uh, a cold or with having, you know, something simple. You don't do that. You pretty much trust them. You might get a second opinion, but for the most part, when your doctor tells you that you have something, and gives you medicine for it, you go take the medicine without even asking. You you trust your uh, kids' teachers. You don't do all the research to make sure that algebra that they're being taught is done exactly right. You might check over your kids' stuff, but you're not questioning every single thing that your teacher is teaching your kids. You're trusting your teachers in order to Give your kids how to read, how to write, how to do arithmetic. You're teaching them to do all those things. And you know you don't have to go and check up, make sure if, if what they say about the Samaritans are, are right or not. You trust them. Then your bank, you trust your bank. You're not calling every day. Is my money still there? Is my money still there? Because you know the bank is going to keep your money secure. We trust people we trust institutions we trust uh we, on one hand we say we don't trust the government but on the other hand we do trust the government now uh, we trust all kinds of people and places a lot of times we mostly trust ourselves we trust ourselves to do this or to do that we trust that we can we can uh, uh, solve problems we have a lot of different kinds of trust what kind of trust do you have in God? It'd be nice if we all had the right kind of trust in God. And it's too bad that we don't have the same kind of trust in God that we do in these other places, as we do as much as we do in our uh, bank, or as much as we do in teachers, or as our doctor. We ought to have better trust than them. See, we don't always trust God to tell us what's wrong. So we doubt, oh, well, society says this is wrong, but God says this is right. 
or God says this is wrong, but society says this is right. And we don't trust what God has to say, or we question whether or not it's true. We don't trust God to tell us what is right. We don't spend his time in His Word. We don't spend time learning who God is. We don't spend time learning the Scriptures to know the right thing to do and the right way to do it. If we trusted God, we would spend our time doing that. Do you trust God to, to secure your commitment to Him? These are things that we should be asking as we ask the questions about faith. What is faith? What is the right kind of faith? How does faith apply? In Romans chapter 4, Paul, he begins and he talks in Romans chapter 1 and 2 and 3, and he says, look, we're under God's wrath. And because we're under God's wrath, every one of us, even, even those we might, might have you know, brought up in a Christian home or uh, have a good sense of right and wrong, but even we are guilty of being of being guilty, being wrong, being ungodly, being righteous. None of us are perfect. No, not even one. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he comes at chapter two, the end of chapter three, and he says there in verse twenty four, he says, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption that is in. Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation of his blood, through faith. That word through faith is what he builds on. In fact, you see the word faith several times at the end of chapter 3, but it's also in chapter 4. And that's really where he nails it. Different people have different ideas of what faith is. Uh, people like to go to Romans chapter 11, but Romans chapter 11 actually describes more what faith does rather than what faith is. It says that there, it says that uh, faith is a substance of things hoped for. Well, what exactly does that mean? A lot of people have difficulty trying to explain that. In verse 6 of that verse, it's the evidence of things that's unseen. Uh, how does faith prove what is unseen? You can see in Roman in Hebrews chapter eleven as it plays out. But I contend, I I suggest that you go to Romans chapter four because Paul is very clear what faith is there. So if you're not there already, Romans chapter four. Here he begins and he takes the first three verses to talk about Abraham. Use him as the example. It's appropriate because a good portion of the Romans that G, that Paul is talking to, writing to, are Jews. And so he is explaining to them, hey, remember your father Abraham. That is the one that they dis, they're descendants of. And how Abraham, he, his faith was counted for righteousness. He says that there in verse 3, that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness credited to him so we see that as he begins here that he wants them to understand what faith is he says in verse one what shall we say then that abraham our father was has found according to the flesh for if abraham was justified by works because he's talking about justification remember that from chapter three then uh, he has something to boast about he worked for it. He can brag about it. But not before God, but before other people. For what does the scripture say? God, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. The word believed and word faith are the exact same in the Greek. So you, you, gotta, you recognize that uh, when he comes here, he's using faith. That the English faith and believe are used interchangeably. Believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now he begins to explain what faith is and how it's applied. Look here. Uh, I'm going to skip into this verse here and get what he says, what Paul says faith is. Start in verse 18. Turn my page here. In verse 18, he says this. Who, contrary to hope, this is Abraham again, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. Faith 
was that contrary to, to, um, to just hope, that Abraham, in the context here, verses 16 on, or verses 13 on, uh, Paul is saying that Abraham was given the promise of a son. And Abraham trusted God. You can look back in the Old Testament and find this in, chapter, in Genesis chapter 12, chapter 15. That Abraham, he trusted God. And Abraham trust, believed God's promise. Abraham was old. And Abraham's wife was old. And she was beyond the years of having children. But Abraham believed God said that they would have a son. And so contrary to hope, that contrary to, to the way normally we think of circumstances happening, uh, a lot of times our hope is there's a chance something can happen. And so I think Paul is, con is contrasting the two here. There's, there's a chance something can happen, so I hope I win. I hope I win the lottery. I hope I see Ed McMahon at my door. I hope that I have a rich uncle somewhere that I don't know about, that he dies and leaves me all his money. That's the kind of hope that we might have. Or, or sometimes it's hope that, you know, I hope people stay safe. Or I hope, you know, nobody gets sick. Or I hope I, when I'm driving somewhere, I, I don't get an accident. You know, we, we use hope that kind of way as more wishful thinking. Uh, Paul says that, you know, beyond, be, there, was, there was no hope. It was hopeless. But Abraham, Abraham, he went beyond that and he believed. He believed, he trusted, contrary the, to the hopeless state. That's what he's saying here in verse 18. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken. Faith is trusting in what even seems without hope. That's what faith is. He gets a little more clear as he goes down here. We go down to verse 20. Verse 20 there. He talks about Abraham. He says, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. That is, through belief, through faith, Abraham, he trusted God's promise, the promise of a son. He trusted God's promise. And he says, do you know what? The, I will not even move from this. Doesn't mean that he didn't have any doubts. Because Abraham did have doubts at times. He he kind of questioned, you know, how was God going to do this? He knew God was going to do that. So he had to trust that way. But he wasn't quite sure how. At first it was maybe through, uh, maybe through his servant. See that in chapter 15 of Genesis. And then chapter 16, uh, since, since uh, nothing has happened, uh, it goes through, uh, 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 Sarah says, take my handmaid. And, and so he has an illegitimate son. But God says, no, that's not what I'm going to do. This is going to be a son from your own body. And finally, eventually, God did fulfill that. It took a lot of years before God decided, this is when I'm going to fulfill that promise. Abraham was 100 years old. He waited a long time when he was given the promise that because they, they were not able to have children, apparently, for the many years that they were married. But God then said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. You're going to have a child and, and his descendants. Abraham, he trusted and he didn't waver. He knew that was going to happen, though, though he tried to cheat that a few times and try to make it on his own. Verse 21 is probably the clearest place where you're going to find what faith really is. In verse 21, it says this, Being fully convinced that what God had promised, God was able to perform. There is a great definition of faith. It's trusting, it's, it's belief, it's not just, you know, I believe it to be true, but it's complete trust. The complete trust that, as he says here, he says, fully convinced. He knew this was the right thing. He didn't convince himself. He trusted the character and person of God. And so God, when he says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, he, to Abraham, Abraham says, yes, I get it. I'm going to believe. 
and he did. Sometimes maybe it becomes a little more clear when you see what faith is not. In verse 4, we see what faith is not. In verse 4 of this same passage, Abraham believed God, it was counted for him as righteousness. In verse 3, Romans chapter 4, verse 4, now to him who uh, now to him who works, the wages are now counted as grace, but as debt. But verse 5, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. What you find here in this passage is that the uh, faith is not works. It's not tr laboring and toiling, trying to achieve. That's not what faith is. And he says, if that's what faith is, if that's what receiving God's promise is, is by you working for it, then then the way it works isn't that, that God just gifts this to you, as he says in chapter 3, verse 24. No, instead, it's a debt. God owes it to you. Well, I guess you met the quota. You did enough good deeds, or, or you're a good enough person. So I guess I owe you the, uh, this, the promise of eternal life. But that is not true. That's not what faith is. There are a lot of people that believe that it's faith or faith plus works. That, that you have to believe, but you also have to stay on God's good side. No, that is not what he says here. He says it is by faith alone that this is done. Now to him who works, the wages are counted by his grace, not, not counted as grace, but as a debt. Verse 5 but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. It, if I go to verse 13, over here, turn my page, verse 13 says the promise that, that uh, he would be the, that Abraham would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. The Old Testament law. Abraham did, wasn't told, if you keep the Ten Commandments, then you're going to get this. That's not what he did. Instead, what he did is that God did. God says, look, I'm gifting this to you. Because you trust me, I'm going to give it to you. That's what faith is. It is not by doing good things that the law has to say. Verse, if that was the case, verse 14 says that if it would be by the law, then uh, the faith is worthless. And what's the point of faith? You don't need to trust God because you're working for it. And in verse 15, uh, long, it says, goes along with the same thing here. Uh, verse 14 says, For if those who are uh, of the law are heirs, uh, Jews are, are going to inherit. Uh, faith is made void and the promises of no effect. If it's just by, by the lineage or in verse 15, because the law, it brings about wrath. The Old Testament law, it did not fix. It pointed out what sin was. It didn't fix it. Jesus had to come to fix the relationship. And if that if if it came by if the Old Testament law was all it took, then well, of course we would all fail. But even at that, the faith would be pointless. No, faith is not trusting myself to do good things. It's not trusting my own goodness. It's not me doing a bunch of good works. That is not what saving faith is. Saving faith is simply. Me saying, God, I trust what you have done. The object of your faith has, is what it depends upon as well. Notice that the what the object of faith is. We're going to go back here to verse 5 of uh, chapter 4. He says, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Who is it that justifies the ungodly? God is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but here he has in mind primarily God the Father. God justifies the ungodly. And it says here 
that the object of your faith is in what God does for you. Verse, uh, we can look and continue and look verse 24. It says about Jesus who was raised from the dead. It says in verse 20, um, no, yeah, verse 24, verse 23. Now it is not written for our sake alone that it was imputed or credited to him, but also for us. It shall, that is righteousness, will be imputed or credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead, our Lord from the dead. Your faith has to be in God. It can't be in, well, God's going to look at my good deeds, and so he's going to say, I qualify. It's not trusting God to look at what I've done, because then I'm really actually trusting in my good deeds. I'm not trusting what he has done for me. Instead, it has to be just complete faith. It's nothing of my own Nothing of myself, it's in what God does for the believer does for the believer. Your faith has to be in God. He is to be the object of your faith. To say to put your faith in Jesus Christ is also right. See, because it's in Christ's sacrifice. If if you're thinking, well, maybe I have my faith in Jesus Christ rather than in God the Father. If you have your faith in Jesus Christ, your faith still is in God. Because you're trusting what Jesus has done for you. Look at what it says here in verses 24 and 25. Again, uh, verse 24, But also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised Jesus from the, our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up, Jesus, delivered up because of our offenses, our sin, and was raised because of uh, or for our justification. The word because in, in both cases there. Um, in verse 25. Delivered up because of our offenses. And in ver uh, raised because. Uh, the word there is uh, for the. It means through or, or for the sake of. So you could legitimately read it this way. Who is delivered up. For, because, for the sake of our offenses, and was raised up for the sake of our justification. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and came back to life three days later. God raised him from the dead. Three days later, Jesus, God the Father was involved in his resurrection. Jesus, the, God the Son, said, if you take my life, I'll take it up again. And even we find God the Holy Spirit was involved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus' sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection is the, has to be the object of your faith. So it works like this. How in the world do I get spared, Romans chapter 1 verse 18, from the wrath of God? Because I'm ungodly and I'm unrighteous. I need to believe God's promise. That if I put my full faith in what he did for me on my account, that he will forgive me and that he will give me the promise of heaven. Look, that's what faith's final result is. Faith's result is imputed righteousness. If I go back here and I look, uh, in, uh, if you notice here, <laughs> the imputed righteousness that's brought up. Look at uh, we looked at verse five, but look there again. Uh, but to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the, the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness or imputed for righteousness. It's credited to him for righteousness. But look in verse six. Just as David also described, bless the blessedness of the man who. God imputes righteousness. To impute means to, to, um, to give credit for. Um, you've done good things that, that people have taken credit for, haven't you? You've done something, you had a great idea, or you did a great job, or a great result, and somebody else came along and took credit for it. Or maybe you've been given, assigned credit for something you didn't want to sign for. You've been blamed for something that somebody else did. That's what it means here to impute. 
to to put on your account to 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 put uh, to put it in your lap and to put it to your credit here what is saying here is when you put your faith in Jesus Christ we learn that God justifies chapter 3 the, and, and it's also mentioned here in chapter 4 justifies the believer he declares the right the sinner righteous he declares him righteous here and the imputing of righteousness says he not only declares us righteous but he puts Christ's righteousness God's own righteousness on us that's pretty fantastic so now you declared righteous but you are made righteous in his eyes because he credits, God credits his own righteousness on you. That is pretty fantastic because then God sees you as righteous. He hasn't just declared you righteous. He credits you with his own righteousness, making you fit to go to heaven, fit for that promise. Verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, every sin that you have ever done or ever will do has been forgiven. And he continues on, whose sins are covered. The, the blood of Jesus Christ washes away your sin. It covers it. And verse 8, blessed is the man whom the Lord shall not impute sin. God to you. You put your faith in Christ. He has credited you his righteousness. And your sin, he doesn't count against you. That is pretty awesome of God. And it's, by, it's a gift from God that's only received by putting your trust in him. Look at the promise. There's a promise that is talked about throughout here. Talking primarily about Abraham. We find it as we go in the beginning in, in verse 3. Uh, it says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. It was accredited to him or accounted to him for righteousness. What did Abraham believe God about? About a promise. In verse 13, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world, that he would inherit it all, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law that is, Abraham or the Jews, it wasn't because of the law that this promise was given. Instead, it was because of faith of Abraham. It says here, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, not errors, heirs, those who would inherit, faith is made void, uh, has made void and the promise has no effect because the law brings about uh, wrath for where there is no law there's no transgression look at verse 16 here in verse 16 it says therefore uh, it is by faith uh, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure uh, to all the seed or descendants not only to those who are of the law, to the Jews, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, the Gentiles. We have the same faith as Abraham had. Our righteousness, our faith is credited to us as righteousness. This here, the promise that's given, going down here, verse 22, it says, Therefore, it is accounted, the, his faith and his promise is accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 21. Uh, and being fully convinced of what God had promised, that what God had promised, God would perform. The, the results of faith for Abraham was that the promises that God made to him, God was going to keep them. Abraham believed that. And because Abraham believed it, God has kept those promises. The descendants of Abraham is Israel, not the country, the Jews. The Jews throughout all of history and throughout history, all the number of Jews, we can't even, can't even count them. And all the Jews, the millions of Jews, is a result of Abraham's promise. There are a number of times where it looked like that the Jews were literally going to be annihilated from the planet. 
There are a number of times in the Bible and even outside of Bi the Bible in, in history that either they would just kind of disappear from the scene or that they would be completely cut off. And the truth is that they are still around. And not only still around, but in great number. And that's because of Abraham's promise. There's much more to this promise, including the land promise and, and uh, uh, the, the millennium, but, but uh, we're not getting into that. But do you see that Abraham, he believed God's promise. And God has fulfilled so far completely that promise. See, well, there's still more yet to be fulfilled. But even up to this point, what is to be fulfilled has been fulfilled. For the believer, there's a promise. Do you remember the promise that we have? The promise is eternal life. We have the promise of eternal life that we forever, that our sins are forgiven, we're justified before God, we're righteous in His sight, we have eternal life. And not only the promise of eternal life, the forgiveness of sins to be able to be with God when, when you pass away or when He comes and takes you, not only that promise, but all the other promises God gives to the believer to take care of you, to, to, to provide for you, to protect you. Doesn't mean that you'll never get sick. Doesn't mean that you won't have hard times. But God has promised to always be with you. He's promised to always meet your needs. You don't know what your needs are. You and I think we know what our needs are. That's not really our needs. A latte is not a need. Now, you and I are convinced. Well, I'm not convinced of that. You might be convinced of that. Uh, uh, your your um, yellow coffee, uh, Mountain Dew. You might think that's a need, but that's not a need. Now, your basic needs, though, have you noticed how God has, has not only provided for that, but also gone beyond? How many times has God shown himself faithful to you? We need to have the kind of faith that rests completely on Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. That when he died, he died for your sin and my sin. If you believe that he died for your sin, and you're trusting what he did is enough to pay for all your sin, and to that God will give you eternal life, be, by you just trusting what he is gifting to you, you are saved. Because your faith is in what Jesus has done for you in his death, burial, and resurrection. Instead of on what you can accomplish or who you are or, or, or what you might achieve. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you got a special promise of eternal life. Not only that, of God always being with you. In fact, you have his Holy Spirit which he promised he is living in you. For when the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God gives you His Holy Spirit in you. God has given that as a promise. Promised it, He has given it. If He has promised it, then trust Him for it. Look in our world today. Can we take that same kind of trust? If you trust God for your whole eternity... We're not talking about, you know, just driving somewhere and trusting God to get you there safely. But once you're there, you don't need to trust God for that anymore. No, you're talking about trusting God for your eternal destiny. If you've got the kind of faith to trust Him for that, do you then also have the kind of trust to say, Look, I'm going to trust God not only to keep me healthy when I go to work, but also to keep me healthy to go to church. Not only am I going to keep my have the do I have the faith that that God is is one day going to to call me home with Him, whether through the rapture of Christ coming or or in death. Not only am I trusting Him completely, I'm not worried one bit about it because I know He's got this. Do you have the same kind of faith when it comes to Him giving you wisdom? about your finances, wisdom about or, or providing for you in various ways. Some of you may have lost your job or you've been laid off. And the truth is you probably have lost your job and you need God's direction, His wisdom. What do you do? 
God will show you these things. God will help you in these things. Trust God for them. If you trust God for eternity, you can trust God for that. You can trust God to, to help you as you, you try to figure out how you're going to school your kids. Because uh, at least in, in uh, uh, the Omaha Public Schools, you're going to spend this first quarter uh, teaching your kids online. And you're not a teacher. Can you trust God enough to help you or to give you wisdom and, and maybe finding the right kind of help if it's needed? Can you trust God to help your family throughout all this changes? Because maybe somebody now needs to stay home instead of work. Will God provide for you? How is that going to work? It's crazy, isn't it? But I'm sure if you can trust God enough for your salvation, that you can trust Him enough that you can say, I'm not worried about it. I'm going to seek God's wisdom. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to see what His Word has to say about it. I'm going to ask other believers that may help me in making this decision. If you can do that, if you can trust God for your eternity, you can trust God to help you in these different changes. You trust God enough to change and transform your spiritual life. Can you trust God enough that He will give you boldness and courage to go share Christ with somebody? doesn't mean you won't be nervous, but, but you can trust God to help you to do that. Can you trust God to transform your marriage to make it what He wants it to be? Can you trust God enough to learn from Him? Do you have unreserved trust in God? Complete faith. Think if we're honest, there's a lot of places in our life that we're not trusting God the way that we should. There's only one kind of faith that saves. That's that unreserved, unwavering trust that you believe God has saved you because you put your trust in Jesus Christ. You've, you've asked God to forgive you for your sins. You've, put, you've, you've asked God to save you. And your faith is in what Jesus Christ did. If you've done that, you're saved. And if you've done that, then you have faith to do that by God's grace. And by God's grace, you can have trust Him to help you with all these other things that are so temporary, that they're important, especially to us, but in the scope of eternity, they're pretty meaningless. I hope that this morning, that as we have looked at Romans chapter 4, it will encourage you to ask yourself, what kind of faith do you really have? God tests your, fight, your faith so you know what kind of faith you have. The different trials Peter talks about, and persecutions even, and for some, that that is a test of your faith. What kind of trust do you have in Him? This COVID, that's certainly a trust in your faith. Do you trust God to keep you healthy? Do you trust God enough to, to, to do, continue to do what He wants you to do, to seek His wisdom, to do what He's called you to do? What kind of faith do you have? Father, I ask that you help us to know our faith and to grow in our faith. I pray that you help us trust you, trust you to meet our needs, trust you to uh, bring about the right circumstances in our life to give us wisdom, uh, wisdom to, and discernment. I pray that you help us to trust you enough to look deeply in your word and to trust what your word has to say. So that way we are following you, that we are not neglecting you, that we're not doing things foolishly. Father, I ask that you will help us. So that way, as we get to know you better, as our faith grows, that we will be able to be discerning, knowing how not to be foolish, but also how to be faithful. Lord, I ask that you will help us be full of faith before you in every aspect. In Jesus' name, amen.